Hey everyone, it's Bill here again and it's December and as has become kind of traditional for me at this time of year, I've knocked together a new piano piece for you to work on. This tutorial will really suit you if you've been through my Piano for Beginners series and you're looking for more material to work on, but also if you want to expand your understanding of how we use written piano music. We're going to be going over some useful technical terms, we're going to be thinking about tuplets, we'll talk about what those are shortly, and also discussing rubato, which is a really, really important music musical concept, especially for us piano players. Now all of that does mean you need to be a music reader to get the most out of this tutorial, but you don't need to be any kind of super genius sight reader or anything like that because I'm going to be going through the more complex material. At a minimum, as long as you can find the basic notes of the treble and bass staves, identify note lengths, time signatures, key signatures, accidentals, you know, things like that, just, just common notation, you should be absolutely fine. Okay, so first off, let's have a listen to the piece with the score on screen. It's called From Sluice Bridge, and it's just over three minutes long. As usual when I do this sort of thing, I've included a download link for a PDF version of the score in the description text right underneath this video on its YouTube watch page. One final thing, if parts of this sound really difficult to you at first, don't panic, okay? For a start, I've kind of cunningly written it so it's not as difficult as it sounds, and also you'll find that the first section of the piece, which is the easiest section, works as a standalone piece of music, so you can just work on that if you want to. And there are also ways of simplifying the later sections. I'll cover all that later in the tutorial. For now though, let's listen to the thing. Here we go.
Okay, so what I want to do first is go through bars 1 to 17 of the score, measures 1 to 17. This is the easiest part, as I said, and it can stand alone as a short piece. So if you find the later parts more challenging, really just focus on these first 17 bars. Let's start by going through some basics. We kick off in the key of B flat major. Okay, we have two flats, B flat and E flat in the key signature, and we're in common time, 4-4 four, four time, yeah, apart from very briefly in bar 9, measure 9, where we have this single bar of 2-4 time. Right at the top, there's a tempo marking, Adagio Teneramente, telling us about the piece's speed. As performers, this is our first big clue about how this piece of music should sound. As a tempo direction, adagio means slowly, but don't play it kind of super slow, yeah? Adagio is usually understood to be kind of between the mid-60s and mid-70s beats per minute. But here's the key thing. To a musician, if a piece is marked adagio, that suggests it should be played with great expression and probably a fair amount of rubato, which I'll come to in a moment. The teneramente part of that direction really just underlines the message. Teneramente means tenderly, so we're looking at a piece that should be played with great tenderness and expressivity. Then in the middle of the staff, between the pickup bar and bar one, we have this marking sempre rubato. Sempre is just the Italian word for always, so whatever it is, we're going to be doing it throughout the piece, okay? And rubato literally means robbed. It's short for tempo rubato, robbed time. Rubato basically means playing around with the tempo of a piece, its speed, at our discretion as performers to add to the expressivity and the overall musical effect. Now on the piano, rubato can be achieved in several different ways, but in this first section of the piece it's very much a case of both hands working together, slowing down, speeding up, pausing for effect, and it kind of gives you a lot of scope for interpretation. So for example, I could play the first few bars with quite light rubato, like this. Can you hear what I was doing there? Mostly I was playing with quite a regular beat, but I had this pause at the end of bar four, okay? I just kind of paused between two phrases there. Alternatively, I could use much heavier rubato. I could play around with the tempo much more. I'm really laying it on thick there, but I could go to that kind of extreme. A really important point is that rubato is often assumed by experienced performers because of the tempo and the context and the style of a piece. If I didn't write sempre rubato here, most experienced pianists would take one look at the style and in particular the adagio tenoramente marking and assume that they needed to use some rubato, yeah? And this is where having some knowledge of different styles and musical traditions comes in really handy because often if you're expected to play rubato, composer won't bother writing it in, they'll just expect you to notice that it's needed. While we're talking about the kind of assumptions performers make, you'll see that I haven't included any pedal markings in these first few bars of the score, and in fact there's only one pedal marking in the whole piece. Does that mean you shouldn't use any pedal? Absolutely not, because this is a piece of music that really demands the use of the pedal. I'm talking about the right hand pedal here by the way, the sustain pedal, so why are there no markings for it? There are two reasons. First of all, putting in all the pedal lines will create a lot of clutter, and as a composer you always do your best to write scores that are clean, tidy and readable. Any experienced pianist looking at this score would realise that it needed sustain pedal. So as a composer you don't write them in, you just assume that the, the, the player will use the pedal. Except in situations, yeah, the one exception is where you want to specify a very particular effect with the pedal. And we'll come on to an example of that shortly.
Secondly, the effect of the pedal often varies from piano to piano, and in any case, exactly how you use the pedal is kind of an artistic judgment that you as a pianist need to make for yourself, because it can make a big impact on your interpretation of the piece. Let me just give you one small example of that. If you have a look at bar three, I could play it like this. That's with the sustain pedal held down throughout. And that gives us quite a rich sound and some interesting discordances. We get in the clash between the D and the E flat there. Okay, but you might not like those discordances. You might want a slightly cleaner sound. So in that case, you could pedal halfway through the bar like this. Yeah, that gives you a lighter, cleaner, purer sound. And as I say, which one you go for kind of comes down to your overall interpretation and the overall sound you want to create with this piece of music. Now that we've covered some of the overall effects that are going on here, let's just have a look at some of the details of these first 17 bars. First of all, I've included some fingerings, yeah? As usual, I've written them in, but they're suggestions. If you're a relative newbie, you're probably best off following them as suggestions, but if you're a more experienced pianist, by all means, obviously play around with them. Just remember to maintain the overall effect that I'm after, Adagio Terramente. There are also various bits and pieces of phrase markings and some dynamic markings. Again, these are guidelines rather than hard and fast rules. So stick to them to start with, but feel free to play around with them as you get more familiar with the piece. Then there's some interesting stuff in the final bars of this first section, bars 13 to 17, measures 13 to 17. You'll see that I've put in a caesura in bar 12, those two little lines uh, in, in the treble staff. And um, really that's just to show that there's a change of style coming up, a kind of break in the piece, because then in bar 13, we've got this marking MD Marcato. MD is short for man or destra, right hand, and Marcato just means marked. So I really want the right hand to sing out here in a marked way above what's going on in the left hand. Then between the treble and bass staves we've got this poco accel, which is short for poco accelerando, yes, yeah? speed up a little bit. Okay, and you'll see that I did that if you listen to the uh, recording a few minutes ago before returning to the original speed at bar 16 with that a tempo marking. Let me just demonstrate that. Let me let me show you what I mean by playing from, let's say, bar 11, where we're still at the original tempo of the piece, okay? And then just listen, as I get to bar 13, how I start to do that poco accelerando, that slight speeding up and then the returning to the original tempo. Here we go, so bar 11. Slight crescendo, a pause, and here we go. So one of the big messages I want you to be getting here is that From Sluice Bridge is a piece that offers you, as a pianist, a lot of scope for interpretation. That's especially true with the pedalling and with the rubato, as I've said, but also with things like dynamics. Even if you're only working on the first 17 bars, you can really make this thing your own. That said, if you want to go further into the piece, you'll find that the principles I've been talking about still holds good. So let's move on and have a look at some of the stuff that's going on in later bars. What happens uh, now after the end of bar 17, we get to bar 18 and this um, kind of change of tone, this figure in the right. And the next few bars to bar, bar 24 are basically just handling the key change from B flat to E flat major. And there's nothing really wild going on, okay? You can take these really rubato if you want. And by the time we get here to these arpeggiated chords in the left hand, really the key change has already happened, except I'm still dropping in the A natural. Okay, uh, that's borrowed from Lydian mode, by the way. Yeah, if you know a thing or two about modes, just to create a bit of a richer sound, a bit of a, bit of a jarring effect almost before we get to this really kind of crazy stuff. And it's not that crazy, but this more lively stuff that's happening in the left hand from bar 24.
straight away in 24 we have this amended tempo direction pock up your muscle a little bit faster so the underlying beats can maybe speed up a little bit here you, you know you don't have to you could take it at the same pace as the first section but just consider picking up the speed a little bit we also have these weird and wonderful looking semi-quaver tuplets, 16th note tuplets in the left hand. Now a tuplet is just a number of notes squashed into a beat or beat division that they wouldn't normally occupy. And the most common part and the most common type of tuplet is the triplet, where you have three notes of equal length squashed in where normally you would just have two. So three quavers, three eighth notes squashed into a crotch and a quarter note, or what have you. Here we have six semiquavers, six sixteenth notes, squashed into a crotchet beat, an eight, uh, a quarter note beat, which would normally only accommodate four semiquavers, four sixteenth notes. Let's just play them, counting in first, okay? So one, two, three, four. Okay, I'm not using any pedal just to show you. One, two, three, four. Can you see how each of those clusters of six notes has been jammed into one beat, okay? Now, the left hand here isn't actually as hard as it sounds because there are only two hand positions, one on that E flat chord and the other on this, you know, I guess kind of E flat sus four chord. And all you're really doing is running up and down the notes in the left hand while playing the melody in the right. And the, you know, the trick is just to keep them reasonably solid against the beat. By the way, if you know a bit about music theory, you might be saying, hey Bill, wouldn't it have been easier to change the time signature in this section to something like 12-8? Then those left-hand semiquavers, 16th notes, would have fitted without having to mess about using tuplets. If you're not familiar with that terminology, we won't go into it now, but the short answer is that I kept things in 4-4 to keep the notation nice and clear and keep that very obvious four beat structure in the right hand. Now the right hand is very simple in this section, it's just single notes, but look at the instruction I've put above bar 25, MD, poco, marcato, e rubato. So we know that MD means right hand and marcato, poco marcato is a little bit marked. We want it to sing out above the arpeggios in the left. But why have I stressed the rubato again here? Basically because I want you to use a slightly different type of rubato from the one we used in the opening section. The left hand should be fairly fixed, but the right hand can roam about a bit more rhythmically. In other words, the two hands can be a little bit kind of unhooked from each other. They don't have to play in exact synchronization. Again, you can vary the extent to which you use the rubato there. In the playthrough a few minutes ago, I kept it very, very subtly. It, it wasn't far off being in, in, in just straight time, okay? But there was a tiny bit. But you could make it much, much more obvious. So I really had the right hand kind of leading there. Just as you're starting out, just as you're learning this section, I will keep it in fairly tight time. But once you're familiar with it, feel free to play about with that rubato in the right hand. Okay, then in bar 33, we have one of the few genuinely tricky bits in the entire piece in the form of this big fast arpeggio that's basically on an E flat chord, apart from this single F near the top of it. Now, the best way to play this is hand over hand. Let me just demonstrate it, and, and I'll give myself the left hand of bar 32 as a run in. You see what I did there, hand over hand. I've marked that in the score using MS, mano sinistra, left hand, and MD, mano destra, right hand, to show where you should change hands. But basically, it was just like this. So down using the left hand and back up, right hand. Okay, let me do it again. Don't forget that F there. And also notice that we've got the pedal marking, the only pedal marking in the entire piece, so as I said, you should use the pedal throughout. We've got this pedal marking between 33 and 34, bars 33 and 34, because I really want you to hold the pedal down there. And the reason for that is that I wanna create this kind of eerie effect with this, this arpeggio lingering in the background while this happens, you know, that kind of eerie and mysterious Lydian A. 
yeah, and the A natural before that G flat chord and the A flat comes in in the right and the pedal comes off. Okay, so the only pedal marking in the entire piece. Yeah. Um, okay, after that, things kind of calm down for a while, and all we really have for the next few bars is a repetition of the material that we had in the first section with a few little variations. We're back to tempo primo, the first tempo, the tempo we started the piece with from bar 34, from measure 34. The only thing you might not recognize is this direction in bar 50, dolce. It means sweet or sweetly. But again, dolce is one of those terms like adagio that musicians understand or tend to understand in a very particular way. I want you to think of a sound that's kind of warm and expressive and singing, but not too lush or heavy. Then right at the end, we have this kind of big fat grand finale from bar 52 onwards with these kind of crashing chords in the right hand. so on. Notice that I've put MF non troppo, moderately loud, not too much. I don't want you going absolutely bananas here. Keep it restrained, okay? If this bit is too difficult for you, remember it's only really a variation of what happened in bars 13 to 17, okay? Okay, that little bit right at the start of the piece, only with chords in the right and this fancy arpeggio in the left hand. If you want to, if you find this, you know, the finale has written too much, don't play it. Just go back and repeat bars 13 to 17 and you'll have a perfectly good, perfectly logical ending, albeit one that's not quite as dramatic as what I've written, okay? At the end, there's that big arpeggio going up and then I want those two final chords to be really delicate. Okay, really, really take your time over those. Look, look at the, each one has a fermata over and under it, a pause mark, so really, really kind of linger over them. So there we go, From Sluice Bridge. I hope you like it. I hope you enjoy playing around with it. Don't forget you can download the PDF score entirely free of charge using the link on the YouTube watch page right underneath this tutorial. Really, really important, don't treat this score as sacred. Feel free to play around with it, make it easier in some of the ways I've talked about. If you want to, I'd rather you enjoyed it rather than really kind of sweated over it. And you know, take on board some of the lessons that I've been talking about here, especially about rubato, about expression, that kind of thing. As always, use your ears, yeah? Judge your playing by listening, not by whether you think you're pressing the right note at the right time, okay? That is secondary. There we go. Any questions or comments, any recordings you make of this, let me know. Always happy to hear from you guys. Please, you know, if you if you learn to play this through, stick it on YouTube. I've been, nothing would make me happier than to see someone else playing it. Um, if you're not subscribed to the channel, hit the little red button in the bottom right hand corner of the screen to get updates on all my latest YouTube videos. Follow me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the links are below. And as usual, please do check out my books, especially How to Really Play the Piano, the stuff your teacher never taught you, which is available both as a print and an ebook edition. There we go. Have fun with this. I'll see you next time.